This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents, but it's not important to the story. I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found strange. To access the lobby, you had to use an elevator. There was no way for you to get to it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were just walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they would just step out their rooms and look around. I always felt afraid that I'd fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death, but they were high enough to a point I wasn't too concerned for my safety. The first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day, or we watched whatever once on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't really fully understand why we were there. On the third day though, things got strange, fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So when I walked out to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious. Maybe she had passed out or something. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby grabbing breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided I'd rush down to meet them all to find out what happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. No big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall, or the letter L. I passed 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about 2 more flights of stairs, before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the 4th floor, nor had there been a door for the 3rd or 2nd. Now at that point, I probably should have turned back, but I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring, and I thought I would be curious and explore. I passed them by, I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby. So I opened them and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really couldn't see much. Chairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the walls, and in the distance, I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of the room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk into the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty, and it seemed like no one had been down there in a while. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevator in the lobby and other floors. I pressed the up button, but to no response. There was a card swiper next to the buttons. 
Must have been for employees only, I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of the hotel. I didn't have a phone because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began freaking out, believing that no one was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than others, so I looked around in areas I could see first before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that no one would ever find me in the basement. I swear it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather the second door I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in a lab coat came out the doors. Now, if this was some 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why a guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and immediately he looked surprised to see me as you'd expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby, and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of here. He didn't answer my question, and instead said, I know a way out of here. Follow me. He began to walk to the doors of the stairwell and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and were now heading towards the darker side of the basement, away from the elevator. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me, and he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking towards the boxes, a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said in a shaking voice, Um, where are we going? He turned and said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by that boxes. I had checked there first after I found out that the door of the stairwell was locked. I wanted to thank whatever god was up there for giving me an idea. I started yelling as loudly as I could. I yelled so loud it gave me a headache, and the man, irritated, began yelling at me and plugging his ears. What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to yell. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went into a full sprint towards the stairwell door, hoping to God they'd be magically opened. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, muttering things like, stupid idiot, and other kind of compliments. I was about five feet from the door when someone burst through, my savior, a hotel janitor who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement, and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was, and I said I had no idea, that he had just come through the door on the other side of the room, and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement, and quietly, so that I wouldn't hear, said, This man came from outside. Get security or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he was simply looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it, and kept saying things like, wait till security gets here and talks to them about it. 
I was standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening, confused out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up to the steps of the lobby where I met my family, who surprisingly had no idea that I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over for their help. I never got to thank the janitor, though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what the man was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. I've thought about that day a lot, and the only explanation I can put together is that the door I'd found on the basement led to the streets of the city where he must have wandered from. I don't know what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is that if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not have been telling this story in the same way, or at all. So strange man in a lab coat wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement. Let's not meet. Two years ago, my husband and I flew to LA for a weekend getaway. We stayed at a boutique hotel off of Sunset. It's more of a hipster type place. Not normally somewhere I'd stay, but it was nice, clean, and had a good vibe. We met up with some of our friends who live in LA and went out for dinner and drinks. It was a late night, and we came back to the hotel. I was exhausted and jet-lagged. It was 1.30 a.m. or something like that. My husband is a very deep sleeper. I'm an extremely light sleeper, except when I've had a bunch of drinks, which I had definitely consumed that night. So it was lights out for both of us very quickly. Around 3 a.m., I only know the time after everything that happened, by the way, I woke up suddenly and opened my eyes. There's a light on in our room. The room had been totally dark when we went to bed. The light was coming from the doorway, which illuminated the silhouette of a man standing at the foot of the bed. Just standing there, staring. For a moment, I am speechless, confused and also slightly intoxicated. I haven't yet moved. My reaction is delayed. And then the stark fear and reality kick in. I gasp and say, what the hell? The man was wearing a red plaid shirt and had dark hair and a beard. I couldn't make out his features as my eyes were adjusting to waking up and the lighting that illuminated him shadowed half his face. I need to speak with Drake. I know this may sound somewhat comical, but I assure you at the time it was terrifying. Get the hell out of here. That jolts my husband awake. He immediately sits up and sees the man at the foot of our bed. My husband is six foot five, which may not be evident given half his body is underneath the bedding. But either way, the man responds, sorry, wrong room, and bolts out, slamming the door behind him. My husband jumps up and runs for the door, but I stop him from going outside into the hallway. Who knows if the man is waiting there in an attempt to lure him out. I keep looking through the peephole, but don't see anything. At this point, we are both shocked and in disbelief, and probably still drunk. We call the front desk to no answer. We call repeatedly and still no answer and contemplate what to do. At around 20 minutes later, we decide to get dressed and go down to the front desk. There's an employee at the front desk, and there's also a bar in the lobby. My husband walks around to see if he can spot the guy who was in our room, and as he's searching, I go up and start telling the guy behind the front desk what happened. But as I begin this story, I burst into tears and realize how shaken I am. The employee gets the manager and he asks me what time the man came to our room, but I don't know how long he was standing there until I woke up. I think he must have been there for a long time for me to just wake up. My husband comes back empty handed. We go back up to the room. The next day, the manager calls and says there wasn't anything on security cameras, but I didn't believe him. He offers us one free night at the hotel as compensation, and even though he claims he didn't see anything, we take the free night because what else is there to do? 
We just want the rest of our mini vacation to go well. But why was the man in our room? How did he have a working keycard? But the thought that I have most trouble with was what would have happened if I hadn't have woken up. Our door was locked, but clearly someone had a duplicate keycard. Here's what I've learned. If you don't already, always put the deadlock on your hotel room door. It's something that we never thought to do until now. And from this point onwards, I always check it. Last year I went to Egypt with a big group of 40. For one night we stayed in this beautiful villa style hotel atop the mountains. The layout for this particular hotel is there is a very long pool in the middle, surrounded by small villas with about 20 rooms per villa. Our group got assigned to the farthest villa from the lobby. It was around 10pm when I decided to go out for a walk to watch the stars. My grandma, who I was sharing the room with, was tired and went to sleep early, so I went out by myself. I walked around the pool, enjoyed the weather and the stars, and I sat on one of the benches by the poolside. It was then I noticed one of the hotel staff, a bag porter, who helped with our luggages when we checked in, approaching me. I thought nothing of it, but he came by and made small conversations. I brushed it off as him just trying to be friendly and courteous to guests. He asked where we came from, and I politely answered. What he said next gave me the creeps. He said his friend was actually looking for a wife from my country. Uh, okay, dude. I laughed it off and lied and said that I was married. He asked where my husband was, and I kind of panicked and told him my non-existent husband got left behind because he had work. He took out his phone and called someone but I guess the person he was calling wasn't picking up. He told me to wait, but my spidey senses were tingling on overdrive. I had two options, to walk back to the villa as quickly as possible, but risk letting this man know which room I was staying in with my grandma, or walk towards the well-lit lobby, hoping that people from my group were still there. I stood up and started making my way quickly to the lobby. The man was still trying to get someone on his phone and tried to call after me, but I waved goodbye and left. When I reached the lobby, I was relieved to see our tour guide leader, our Egyptian tour guide, and probably three ladies from the group still there. No more creepy hotel staff. Or so I thought. In the hotel lobby, they have a bunch of souvenir shops set up. One of the ladies I was close with, B, was browsing inside the papyrus souvenir shop. Our guide warned us beforehand that the papyrus painting they sell at the hotel is fake, or just generally low quality tourist trap souvenirs. So I went inside the shop to tell B about that in case she had forgotten. Inside the shop was me, B and two salesmen. One of them was standing near the door and blocking the only means of exit. B asked for my opinion between two paintings, and this salesman standing in front of us told us that these paintings have a different pattern that shows up in the dark. It glows, you see. He asked if we wanted to see it. I firmly said no before B could answer, and I had enough. I'd had enough for the day, and just wanted to go back to our room. However, this persistent salesman said something to this other man standing behind us, who then proceeded to close the door and the light switch. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I do not like the idea of being in a pitch dark room with two men who I don't know. I could also sense that B was panicking and she held onto my wrist. Like an angel in disguise, the door suddenly opened from the outside and it was B's aunt, who was also in the lobby with us, with our tour guide who shouted at us and asked what we were doing. She motioned for us to come out quickly, and I swear I don't know what would have happened if B's aunt didn't open the door at the time. She made a fuss over it, and the rest of the group walked back to the villa together with our tour leaders. 
On the way to the villa, Lee's aunt asked us if anything happened, if our phones and wallets were still there and all. We checked our belongings and everything was fine. No one followed us back to the villa, and I was happy to see that we were also checking out the next morning. So to the creepy porter and salesman at the hotel, if I ever find myself back there, I really don't want to meet again. I also want to say that I don't mean to generalize or talk ill of a country. It just happened in Egypt. I don't think that all Egyptians are bad people or creepy, but these hotel staff, regardless of nationality, acted very creepy and unprofessional. I just really don't want to meet them again. I have a story I wish to share with you of a little family vacation I took four years ago. At the time, it was me, my mother and my father, and four other visiting family members from overseas. We were showing them the best major tourist traps Maryland had to offer, and unfortunately, Ocean City was one of them. I was sitting on the benches with my mum and one of her sisters at the back entrance of the hotel we were staying at. It was just us three out there, a few people in the distance, and no one on their room balconies yet. It was getting dark, and I was just staring blankly up at the pink sky while they chatted in blue cigarette smoke lovingly in my face. The moon was up, indicated it had been a long day. Those guys wanted to see everything. They walked through the summer heat like it was nothing, while I almost had a stroke. We were probably out there for seven hours. Hell, maybe even more. My time blindness is just as bad as my tolerance for heat. The visiting family members came from a small country with a population almost catching up to New York. And the most common crimes were opportune street crimes like theft and scams. So it was easy avoiding and ignoring everyone and anyone on the street with a shared paranoid mistrust of anyone approaching us on the street with a smile or pamphlet in hand. It was a simple routine. Turn your attention away from them, weakly hold up your hand and make a small muttered semblance of something along the lines of no thank you. Or perhaps a bit more than that, depending on how pushy you were. Forget what just happened, walk on and repeat every several minutes or so. You know the drill. It was the kind of thing you don't think about twice, the whole interaction akin to a social form of clearing your throat from a cough. It happened a lot in the beginning, as we opted to walk to our destination since our hotel was kind of in the middle of everything. We would have had to walk down long linear lanes and pedestrian streets to get to the towns with actual things to do. That's where in all my experience, most Ponzi scheme recruiters tend to set up since they couldn't really get into the heart of the attractions. Police tended to harass most homeless and leafleters away from the squares, either out of boredom or the obligation to keep a certain image for the town. So they would surround the paths leading into the populated square. Of course, there were a lot of unmemorable encounters, but as aforementioned, we got through that part pretty quickly. The problem stemmed from our foreign friends inability to understand in any language, the simple request of don't leave our side, because one state in America can be more dangerous than your entire country alone. And you don't know where you're going. East Coast etiquette, or how to speak English, which is something that really matters here. It caused the day to go by a lot more slowly and simultaneously more hectic than it needed to be. Fortunately, we got back before it turned dark, and by then, the usually scammy, busy pedestrian streets were empty. As it was common knowledge that you couldn't stay out alone at night, no matter what the cost of whatever you're selling is. So yeah, when we got back, every molecule in my body melted onto that bench after experiencing hours on end of blasting summaries and stress from every direction. It wasn't long after my mum and her sister finished their chat and smokes and were ready to head inside. I told my mum I wanted to stay out a little longer. 
It was really nice outside. It finally cooled down, and the wind carried the scent of the ocean, instead of sand blasting in my eyes as the sun was setting. I wanted to stay in it just a little while longer before heading back into a cramped two-bed hotel room filled with six other family members who all hated each other. My mum was cool with it, as our room was only a few floors above and facing where we were sitting, and the entrance back to the hotel a mere few feet away from us. She took my bag with her after offering and headed inside. My aunt snuck me a cigarette before scattering off too, and I was left alone behind the hotel. All I had on me was a cigarette, a tiny lighter, my phone and my thoughts. I lit up my cigarette and pulled out my phone to read for a little bit. Barely several minutes had passed, and I was about to ponder how the hell we were going to get through DC, when I heard someone distinctly call out. I ignored it at first, but then it got closer and I could hear it was directed my way. Excuse me, miss. I looked up, hating knowing it was addressed to me. I hated being called that, but even more, I just wanted not to be bothered. At first, judging by the tone, I thought it would be someone who needed directions or some minor help like that. The energy I would normally put towards making someone a welcome smile quickly directed itself to my legs as I shot up to my feet in bewilderment. It was a tall Indian male coming around from behind the side of the building and making his way around the fenced in platform of the lounging area. He was probably in his early 30s or very late 20s. It was dark, and I had a pair of sunglasses on, so it was hard to tell. He was dressed in a Hawaiian shirt, cargo shorts, and flip-flops. Usual beach attire. They were kind of baggy on him, and they looked pretty worn in. He had a very lousy satchel draped over his chest. I could tell that, at best, he was outside all day. It reminded me of how my dad would look after he mowed the lawn on a hot Maryland summer's day. He had pamphlets in his hand, and I remembered very quickly him being a leafleter I ignored earlier in the day. I also remembered that we were at the halfway point between the town and our hotel, and when it occurred, so I was a little shaken up, as I expected that to be our only interaction, far away from the hotel. But I told myself I shouldn't have been scared, and that I was overreacting. And it was probably my unchecked anxiety giving me a false alarm in my stomach. It didn't stop my voice from shaking, though. Can I help you? His face lifted up. He started walking over a little faster. My feet stayed in place, and my arms stiffened by my side, like a deer in headlights. Something was off. How did he get here? The first thought I thought of scared me. But it also filled me with doubt thinking that there was no way he could have followed me all the way back here. After all those twists and turns, and the stores we went to, all the time we split up into different groups and wandered around aimlessly to look for each other. After all that time had passed, I wasn't sure. So I asked him, not really expecting him to admit to following me back to my hotel, if he really was guilty of that. Did you follow me here? That's when he went off. When I saw you, I thought you were the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I had to talk to you. I stopped listening after that. My heart dropped. Then it went into overdrive. I was stalked for miles on end and hours. And judging by that opening, I had very little doubt that he wasted no time to follow me. And I hadn't noticed the entire time. Not only that, the six other people around me hadn't noticed either. It was scary to think how life went on so unsuspectingly that day. I started to blame myself for not noticing. I was being followed the entire time. How many times was I walking down the street and I could have just turned around to see him? Did he follow me into stores? Did he get close enough to know any crucial information about me? How many times was he able to just stand there and stare? Then there was a sudden proverbial click somewhere in my world. Like I had unlocked something, I became suspicious of his timing. 
It took only several minutes of me being alone, all past accompaniments fully and assuredly gone for him to appear. It clicked that he was waiting for me to be alone. How long was he waiting? Why did he need to speak with me while we were alone? I didn't like that, and he was walking towards me. Please stop, I said, not indicating what I exactly wanted to stop. Stop talking, stop walking towards me, stop being scared, I said loud enough, but I didn't say it strong enough. Hell, I said please. Of course he didn't stop. He continued rambling on about how beautiful I was, and while getting closer, I panicked, as he stuffed his pamphlets into his shoulder bag and took out his phone. It wasn't fair. He had a bag full of God knows what, and I just had my cigarette on the wet floor, a tiny lighter, my phone and my thoughts. He told me how he wanted to have my social media, my phone number, and he told me he was going to take me somewhere with him, like a quick date after we exchanged contact info. They weren't questions. He told me exactly what he was going to do. He said I was such a beautiful girl, and he was going to show me how good of a man he will be to me, and how he'll make me fall in love with him. He sprinkled compliments like it would make things less creepy. He must have known I was scared. He was talking so fast, like he wanted to tell me everything he wanted from me before he reached me. He got close enough to begin to climb onto the stairs onto the platform, tapping frantically on his phone in front of him. I was beginning to see how dirty he was. His sweat-marked shirt and shorts had holes in them. It looked as though he'd been outside all day for a week, and maybe once washed up in a McDonald's bathroom with hand soap, and his phone screen lit up his face. I got a good look at him. It felt like staring at a car accident. He was poorly shaven. His eyes were wide, dark and bloodshot. I don't know if it was because of lack of sleep, drugs or both. He looked filled with a joyous and deranged hope. All I know is that they did nothing to lessen the unsettling feeling that that toothy grin gave me as it stretched maniacally across his face as he continued to talk down at his phone. For whatever reason, whether it be he was starting to step into my territory, seeing his face, or some other third thing, that's when my fear turned into anger. I've been harassed by one too many people at this point in my life to not get angry and fight back and win. But I knew that there was no way in hell I could screw up any more than I was now. If there was one thing I knew about people like him, is that by choosing to do that in that moment, is because he's a coward. If you take one step more towards me, I'll scream, I said as angrily as I could, for someone who was close to collapsing on the floor and crying like a baby. Of course I was right in front of a hotel with balconies and neighboring hotels. And even though there was almost no one close enough to me outside at this moment, I knew he wasn't gonna take the risk. I don't know why I threatened him and didn't do it just there and then. I don't know what I was trying to prove and to who, but this was the plan now. He stopped and looked up at me, his eyes wide, but his creepy ass smile gone, replaced with a slight agape snarl. I saw a mix of emotion shake through him, shock and anger with fear and then more fear. After a beat of silence, he began what I knew would be an entourage of half apologies and reverse blame. Instead of walking towards me though, he stepped off the stairs and back onto the sand. I cut him off again, no, and stomped my foot. I was far from a frightening looking character, pale ass, skinny ass, trans kid, with an oversized sun hat and blue hair, in terrible need of re-dying. So being loud was the best way to be somewhat threatening. Thinking back on it, I kinda think it's funny how stomping my foot and saying no like a toddler made him look even more scared. I started to walk forwards towards him, anger pushing away every other emotion. Dumb idea. For real. I should have run the other way, but I guess I got power hungry in the moment. He was still apologizing, taking a few steps back as I stomped towards him. I yelled over him, leave me alone, go away, and if I ever see you again, I'm gonna call the cops. That seemed to do it. 
He rushed away, agreeing and apologizing still. I stood and watched as he disappeared behind the hotel next door. I don't know why, but I sat down again and stayed out for a little bit longer before it got too dark and I went back in and was finally able to cry like a baby. I didn't tell my parents what happened. They were either going to act erratically or scold me for telling them something that would cause them more stress. So for the remaining days we would go out, I just kept looking over my shoulder. It was the best thing to do. I didn't go out on the balcony of our hotel room in case that guy came back. I didn't want him to know which room I was in, let alone which floor I was on. On the day of the last night, I saw him again. I was going back upstairs after getting a morning cup of coffee from the main floor. I didn't have to look at his face again. Luckily, it was covered by his unkept hair. I recognized him by his clothes. He was still in the same clothes and carried his same satchel, no pamphlets this time. He was talking to the front desk on the opposite side of the door, and I put my hood up as to not be outed by my blue-green hair, entered the elevator, and watched him through the glass of the elevator walls. Later, I would go on to tell front desk about him, and that it was probably best if he wouldn't be let back into the hotel, and if they could help it. I stayed up the whole night that night, still wondering what he would have done to me if I'd have let him get close enough to touch me, and how exactly he'd have made me fall in love with him. So Leafletter, who believes in love at first a little too much, get a real job, and let's never meet again. I was an undergrad in university, and studying abroad in Southeast Asia for a year. During my time there, I visited India during Easter break, including three days in Mumbai. A friend of mine who was originally from Mumbai had recommended I stay at the Cricket Club of India, which is probably a dozen hotel rooms and could be booked via club members. Beautiful place that seems stuck in time. It was stunning to wake up to the players practicing. In the afternoon, they would serve tea and gin and tonics on the turf, and I had such a good time. I believe it was my last night there where I decided I would stay in and have a meal at the house restaurant. The service was great, though one of the waiters, a middle-aged guy, was a bit too chatty. But then again, what's wrong with making conversation with a guest about where they're from and how they're liking Mumbai? He struck me as a bit lame and sleazy, but put it down to age. His eyes were giving me a flirty look, and at the end of my meal I asked, I believe another waiter, whether it would be possible to take a bottle of beer upstairs to my room. Sure, we'll bring it up, which was odd because I could have just taken it with me, but this place was so old and stiff that I'd figured I'd stick to their customs. So I go up, and around 10 minutes later, there's a knock at my door. Oddly enough, two waiters are there, the young one who I had ordered the beer with, carrying the tray with a beer and two glasses, and the sleaze ball. I was gobsmacked and shy and young and naive and friendly. That I just stood back, holding the door open while they marched in. The young waiter placed the bottle of beer and the two glasses on the table while the sleazy one stood there. It was only seconds and my naive head was trying to figure out how to respond to the two glasses. The young waiter then picked up his tray, walked out the door, and the sleaze ball goes, thank you, close the door. That second, I finally burst out of my catonic state and went, no, please leave, to the sleaze ball. He questioned me whether I was sure. I made eye contact with the young waiter who was not sure what to do and was probably used to just taking orders from his boss. Yes, I said in a strong and forceful tone, while trying to remain as polite as possible. And with that, he finally left. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. I'd imagine he'd get spare keys to get into my room, and I was relieved that I would be leaving the next morning. Nowadays, I do not understand why I didn't react differently, but it was probably a matter of age and naivety. However, creepy waiter, I'm not sure what your intentions were, and I don't want to find out, but please, let's never meet.
Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's video. Hotels are always fun, especially when probably most of us doesn't have a hope in hell of seeing a hotel anytime soon. So yeah, we can just remember why we don't want to be there. That being said, hotels aren't all that bad, really. It's the people who are creepy. Didn't have any hotels with ghosts in it this time round. Um, all just creepy people, but maybe we'll have a paranormal edition of hotel stories at some point in the future. I think that'd be fun. One of my favorite shows growing up was Haunted Hotels. I know it's such a random show for kids to enjoy watching, but I did, I've always loved scary things. That's obviously why I do this job. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys again. You know what to do if you enjoyed it. You can leave your feedbacks and your comments and your praises down below. It really is appreciated. Um, as always a huge thanks to my amazing patrons. You guys on screen are amazing. If you'd like your name on screen and a handful of prizes, prizes, well yeah, rewards, feel free to check out my Patreon. My wife's actually just completed a new set of rewards for patrons, which are gonna be sent out when the postal service works again. And, uh, and yeah, I'm also still doing that uh, giveaway on Instagram and Twitter. So follow me over there when we hit 3k on each. That's when they're going to be sent out Well, drawn and then sent out whenever, whenever they can be sent out. All right, then. Well, enough of my ramblings. Thanks, guys. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.